Now let's see if my internet behaves this day. <laughs> it didn't last week. Yes, it's, it's behaving. All right. We are live. And I'm here with Simon Godfrey. Hello, Ron. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, I remember the first time I heard of, heard about you was when you guys, Tiny Fish. Oh, yes. Yeah, I can see it. And then we got Curious Things. Oh, yes. And then this is the one that you... I say this is the the first one I got into. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, the Big Red Spark. Yeah, and I, and I did have the the DVD of your the, where you played live, that live show in, in oh, Pol yeah. Poland. That's right, yeah, and, One Night on Fire. Yeah, I had that, but, you know, when I did some moving around, uh, I misplaced a lot of things, so they're probably, it's probably in a corner somewhere, but... <laughs> But it was a good it was a good video i mean it's i mean obviously because of the pandemic they don't they didn't continue those kind of uh series of uh, live yeah. concerts you know because i thought that they were they were on a roll you know it seemed like every every band was playing there yeah it was it, for, for a while metal mind were the the people behind that series of concerts and i i think it, it first sort of uh, sprang to life through uh, Nick Barrett and Pendragon. And yeah. then I know that um, we were invited to play on the bill with, um, uh, I think, I can't remember if it was Pendragon or if it was um, uh, one of the other projects that uh, Clive, keyboard player Clive Nolan was in, involved with. But uh, it was Clive uh, Nolan who invited us out. And Clive is like, if you've ever met Clive, he's one of the nicest people you could possibly hope to meet. He's a, uh, and he's also an incredibly um, accomplished um, both writer and stage performer in his own right. Right. And uh, and so he was the guy that gave us the invite. And um, I always remember he gave us a great bit of um, uh, of information about uh, performing live in front of cameras. Because right. we met, I, I I didn't meet him directly. The very first time I actually met Clive was when we were out in Poland on the morning we were about to shoot the DVD, and we were in the hotel in uh in the sort of uh, the common area, the breakfast area, having breakfast, and I thought I'd go over and introduce myself because we hadn't spoken face to face, and uh, he said, "Yeah, sit down," and we we sort of chatted over breakfast, and I sort of said to him, "Look." This is the very first time we've ever done a live DVD. Do you have any advice for us? And he sort of ruminated on this for a little while and he sort of sat back in his chair and he said, well, if there was one thing I would have to say is perform, put on a performance for the for the cameras. He said, everything else can be fixed in the mix, but a lackluster performance on stage, you can't do anything about it. Right. Um, right. And he said, and, and you know, and I thought, well, that's great advice. But unfortunately, we were at that time obsessed, absolutely obsessed in Tiny Fish with putting on the perfect concert. So I kind of think I, I, I really do feel as though while I took that on board at a later stage, I wasn't able to process it for that show. And so as a result, when you see the show, we're playing, you know, and we're, we're performing and stuff. But yeah, I kind of feel that we could have done more. Right. You know, we were too busy trying to just play well to actually perform more. And now right. when I look back at it, I mean, Leon, our drummer, um, uh, Leon Campfield, who was the drummer for Tiny Fish, he's a fantastic performer and he's always a joy to watch. And he's always the guy I always watch when I, I, I look, if, if I look at that video for any reason. Um, the rest of us, you know, we're performing live, but my personal opinion is Leon's the real star of that show. Right, right. Well, you know, I've seen uh, live performances where people are just basically standing there doing nothing, like, you know, probably 
maybe they have stage fright or, you know, like you said, you know, they don't have any skill at being yeah. a performer. They just know how to play their instrument, but they sit there and then you have some wildly animated bands. Um, one of the ones I saw back in 93 uh, in Los Angeles, the first Prague Fest. Yeah. Um, this band was putting on, I could have been something close to Lord of the Rings or King Arthur while <laughs> they were playing Prague. And it was like, okay, that was very to the one extreme, you know, and then you have the other where there's people just standing there, you know, kind of almost like the shoegaze. Yes. You know, just yeah. standing there looking at their shoes, you know, it's like, you know, but no, that. I think all of those performances that uh, Metal Mind did were really good, and they picked a lot of the great bands to oh yeah to come yeah. over, and hopefully maybe on the flip side of this pandemic thing, um, someone if not them, someone will pick up, you know, because they were successful, you know. I mean, they were putting out uh, DVDs and then DVD CD combo. So it was like, I, you know, I think that that was good. I mean, that that was, you know, because a lot of you know UK and European yeah. bands don't get a chance to come over to the to America. And so that's like the next best thing for some of us to exactly. It was incredible exposure for us as a, as a band because uh, and I you know I I constantly when if I ever get an opportunity, um, I I want to go out of my way to say thank you to both the guys in Metal Mind who are still I think knocking about and also um, uh, Clive for for inviting us over. That was a very um, cool thing that he did, and we'll always really appreciate it. But it was also um, a window. It was the very first time that we'd, we'd ever got to work with Rob Aubrey because Rob was the guy yeah. that mixed the sound for that show. Right. And so uh, Rob Aubrey is like, I suppose the best way to describe him, he's like the um, uh, the sort of, you know, um, the, the George Martin of prog. He's right. like if there's if there's some guy if you know certainly in Europe if there's like a band that that needs decent live sound or needs a mix or something, you know, uh, Rob is always there in the background, sort of like helping out. And funnily enough, actually, that was um, he has a little studio. Sorry, do you you don't mind me uh, talking? Oh about no, this. keep on. I like that. <laughs> he has a little <laughs> studio on the the south coast of England called Orbit Studios. Fantastic little place, um, and. Um, it's very comfy. Uh, he's got all of the mod cons, and it's um, it's one of those places, one of the most comfortable recording studios I've ever had the pleasure to work in. And we were mixing the um, the live uh, CD and the soundtrack for the DVD at Rob Studios. And of course, you know, being a London band, it, it can be a little bit, you know, tribal, sort of like there's a London band and we're down on the south coast and. Um, and so as a result, what happened is that we found that a lot of the South Coast progressive artists were dropping in just to say hi, because here was, a you know, us from us hairy assholes from London, sort of like into the studio and stuff. And that was funnily enough um, how I first met uh, Greg Sporton from uh, from Big Big Train. Oh, yes. He's, he's local. And of course um <clears throat> rob is is like the fifth beetle if you can call him that um when it comes to big big train he's always like the guy behind the the scenes right. making big big train sound awesome didn't so rob that was... all, wasn't rob all, doesn't he also do uh stuff for iq yes or... he does yes yeah he's also i think he's like you know one of the sort of the people behind the giant electric p label and stuff and uh yeah yeah so he he you know that was when i got to sort of like meet a lot of people from from that neck of the woods, I got to meet um, uh, Robin Armstrong from uh, who eventually went on to become part of uh, the uh, Big Big Train live uh, band. But he also has a fantastic band called Cosmograph as well. Yes, I heard of that. And uh, and so as a result, 
I got to meet Robin. I got to meet uh, Greg, and there was a, a, another guy, and I can't remember his name now, but he was also a very gifted um, artist, and he came down. So yeah, it was a, a you know all 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 told, it, it gave us a lot of exposure. Um, it was a great experience, and uh, uh, it, it helped us reach a lot more fans than we would have otherwise done for precisely the reasons you mentioned, which is you know stateside we weren't able to get across there anywhere near as often as we would liked. And so that kind of did the touring for us, if you know what I mean. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the one thing about the, uh, the DVDs and now bands that are out Blu-ray that, you know, they can reach more people that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then now, you know, seeing a couple of bands that are doing those uh, live live streaming of concerts, you know, like, what was it? The Pineapple Thief did it. Oh, yes, oh, indeed, man. yes. I mean, I think they poured in a lot of money into that because I hear it, they had multi uh, cameras and and because they put it out on Blu-ray and the CDs. It's like, that, that could be the future because then that way you can reach a little bit more people. You know, I've, yeah. I've, I've always kind of said that ever since starting this show you know to for uh at first when we couldn't do you know shows and then second now that bands are slowly starting to do shows um if they do a live feed they can not just reach that uh couple hundred people in there in the audience but they can reach thousands you know yeah. worldwide yeah. Absolutely so, right. It's one of the things which I think um, will definitely become, I don't think it'll ever take over. No. Um, I could be wrong, but I certainly think that it will become an integral part of um, a sort of a band's repertoire of, of, of channels to reach out and, and touch new people. Um, I mean, it's one of the things which, um, like, for example, uh, it would have been fabulous if we'd have been able to sort of di um, uh, discipline, did a, a recent... Um, yeah, uh, so, uh, 20th anniversary or tw uh, of, of Unfolded Like Staircase, their album. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they did a live show uh, through um, uh, uh, Mark and, and, and Rania's um, uh, uh, sort of progrock.com in Chicago. Yeah. And a lot of people turned out. I would have loved to have been there, and I, I could not, unfortunately, make it to, over to Chicago. But, yeah, the whole idea of being able to sort of, like, live stream one of those concerts or record it and then release it later on on YouTube, that would have been fantastic. But, you know, oh, yeah. it's a lot of money you have to put up front for that kind of stuff, if you know. Oh, yes, that. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it'd be nice if there was, like, a company that some, that would help out, you know, Prog bands to be able to do that. Well, it's funny you should make mention of that because <laughs> uh, locally here in Pennsylvania, there is um, a a company, uh, the studios called Catapult Studios, which are located in North Wales in Pennsylvania, and they do precisely that. They do live stream concerts from the studio. Oh. Um, so yeah, you can go down and um, and and you know for 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 a, a fee, sort of like you know get do a live stream if you've got new material coming out or you've got a new album coming out you can go down there and essentially put on a show uh live online for people to uh um to look at and they they will then mix the audio afterwards and then you can release that as a uh as, as a as like a dvd or a blu-ray uh and or put it on youtube as well right yeah so there I mean, are so... people doing it yeah it's like i mean technology it just i that's the one thing i noticed with the pandemic is it kind of sped up some things mm. a couple of people have have noticed that, that there's some things that got sped up like um one guy uh because because he was always busy writing his music and and rehearsing it and then obviously going live that he never got to do stuff from behind the scenes of like mixing and mastering and things like that and he learned how to do that while during the pandemic so it's yeah. like there were some things that you know people did and then i noticed there's some bands that basically put the brakes on and you know put the thing aside and you know not not worry about it until recently you know so it's like it's i think it's 
a personal thing. You know, people either go head into working on music and recording music, and some people just said, ah, oh, well, it, you know, usually the process is you record your music, put it on a CD, and go on tour. But then the tour part was not in the equation. So it it's short like, circuits well, the entire mechanism, doesn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I mean, some people, it short circuit them really good. And others, you know, they go, well, okay, maybe I can pump out some more music. <laughs> well, whatever is, whatever is going on. I, I have to say, I think I have a prediction that um, 2023 you're going to see a lot of people releasing material during 2023 because like it's basically been two years and essentially yeah. that's two years you know potential writing time um and i think you know i i always like to be optimistic about this and i genuinely think that this in the long term could be a good thing for bands to have this enforced hiatus because you'll find that it's two years of of, of you know isolation and, and self-reflection and maybe a little bit of self-improvement you come back a better artist i'd like to think yeah. you can do that anyway yeah i'm thinking uh i kind of think maybe the the third quarter of next year and into 2023 is you're going to see a lot of things i mean maybe yeah multiple albums from a single artist you know yeah. um there's one band um in tennessee called evership that they put out in january they put out an album and then i think it's coming very soon they're going to put out the second part and then you had yeah. uh, glass hammer that is already put out the second of their trilogy so it's like you know, it's like, it's like, I think they, they were one of those people that just kind of went in headstrong to create music. And I, I fully applaud uh, any artist that can, can see this as an opportunity to be creative because it's very easy to feel negative about this and feel as though you've been stifled. But, you know, th there is opportunity even in this kind of seemingly depressing circumstance you know it is an opportunity to be creative to to dig down to actually produce these magnum opuses which you wouldn't necessarily have the time to do if it had been at any other point in their career right and also too um i know if it's not going to be a serious one or if it could be a parody that someone is going to do a a concept album about covid19 oh yeah i mean sooner or later i, I mean I think you'll find there's going to be a glut of COVID-19 songs. I'm going to predict where it's going to come from. Okay, go on. The UK. <laughs> I don't know who's going to do it, but it's going to come from there. Because That's the one thing is um, a sense of humor from there is just, I mean, the best in the world, to be honest. Oh, I suppose that this is something which I actually I would take umbrage because when I arrived over here, um, I arrived uh, in the US to live full time, I think it was about close to about eight years ago now. Yeah. And I remember arriving here with um, not necessarily a set of assumptions, but uh, I, I, I sort of like felt I was going to have to change to be, you know, fit in with uh, with American society. And I found um, a load of really surprising things. First off, I found that the media that you read about does not paint a full picture of any country that you go and visit. Um, I found that um, American um, comedy and American music, uh, you know, it's just as nuanced, it's just as funny, it's just as ironic, it, you know, because really at the end of the day, and it sounds like a, a very obvious thing to say, we're all human beings, you know, right. we, we come from the same stock. And so there's no real, I think in some ways, um, I, I love um, my homeland. I think it's a fabulous place. I very much miss all of my friends there. Um, but I've found a new group of friends over here who are just as funny, just as creative, just as interesting. Um, and um, sometimes I think 
in in a lot of ways um america gets painted with with a um a feeling that you know the humor um is not as as developed over here it is it's fantastic it, it is it is um i think it's uh well from of all the you know the the british uh sitcoms that i've watched i mean it's just um there's a difference there's a there is a difference they're both funny you know because americans i think the american sitcoms are more kind of in the slapstick realm where it's just you know gags of, you know like that you know and i don't know the, the for me at least the ones that i've watched uh like monty python and uh red dwarf and the i the it crowd i mean the, I laugh more with them than I do with the American because it's almost like some of the American comedies are trying to be safe about stuff and and it, they lose the humor that way. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's supposed it was basically it's to make fun of of a situation. You know? I think it. I think it comes down to the fact that there's more emphasis on that kind of sort of uh, ironic. Um, socially inept humor. I mean, if if, if ever there was my, my my favorite comedy shows is the IT crowd for yeah. that exact exact reason. But it, it comes, you know, you can see that in in the office in the American version of the office as well. It's just as nuanced. It's just as funny, and it shows just as many awkward situations. Curb your enthusiasm is another classic uh, case in point. But I also, uh, if we if, going back to music for a second, with regards to the differences between sort of one country and another. Um, one of the things that I found when I came over here is that there is um, a much um, stronger tradition of, um, of, of, being, of being technically capable on your instrument over here. And that I've, I've found over the years, and I'm, you know, I can't say that this is absolutely for sure, but I, you know, I found a lot of anecdotal evidence to indicate that Things like marching band is, uh, you know, in schools that doesn't exist in the UK, and so as a result, sort of like a British musicians are largely left to fend for themselves and get into it and learn for themselves. Whereas, with with you know with band in school, you have that that basis, that grounding of of playing, and I really have noticed it now, having played with a British band and an American band, their approaches are a lot different. There's a lot of, um, uh, what's the word? Um, there's a lot of technical competence, just as at a base level um, right. in the US um, that just isn't available in the UK. And in some ways that is a, a kind of a trial for UK musicians because you have to really want it. Right. to be to be a music you know to be a good musician technically capable musician in the uk whereas you kind of can fall into it on this side of the atlantic because it was part of your school curriculum right right yeah and and uh not only that uh in my junior high which now they call middle school and then high school we'd have talent shows and yeah. they would have, they have, they'd have uh I mean, this is back in late, that's 1979 and then into the, into the early 80s. I mean, we'd have that music being, you know, by, by your peers, you know, it's like, and I'm thinking, I said, like, oh, I didn't know he could play that, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and it was, uh, that's the one thing that I don't know if they still do that in school where they have a talent show or you know of sort and i thought that for me that was something i always look forward to and that was kind of my um you know window into music even though at that point i really wasn't you know locked in and you know so passionate about you know getting music and and uh every new bands i mean i i think i just i want to say in the 90s is when my full discovery you know because 
think a whole, you know, especially the Swedish bands, you know, the, they were, and, uh, and the other country, you know, Norway and some from Finland, not so much from Finland, but it seems to be Sweden and Norway were the ones where in the early 90s where they were coming out and basically just saying, hey, you know, this music, this style of music, didn't go away you know it's still here people young people are passionate about doing it yeah i mean you know? on the other side i think you can say in general there was during the mid 90s there was another sort of second wave if you could i mean you've got the 70s bands um yeah. you know the genesis the, the classic prog bands of the uh, of the 70s then you've got the early 80s now there was a bit of a renaissance in the U uk i don't know whether or not you're aware of it but like bands like Marillion and Pendragon and IQ and Twelfth Night and Palace, like you know, the, these were the these were the guys that were getting snapped up by the major labels, and then it sort of went away again. And I, I that was the that was the generation of progressive rock that I grew up with. I grew up with yeah. those those kind of bands. I used to go down to see them at the Marquee all the time. And then during the nineties, there was a sort of another uptick. You know, like bands like Spock's Beard and porcupine tree and uh you know the the very beginnings of big big train for example were, were really oh, yes. in the 90s as well um and and as a result you got um a, another sort of second wave and i'll be honest with you during the 90s i missed that because i kind of fell out of the prog world at the beginning of the 90s um when i started doing a lot more session work and a lot more uh work outside of that that world as uh because i started work life as a drummer spent 10 years playing drums before oh, i switched okay. to guitar um and then i think it was really sort of like the the tail half of the 90s um was a, a big uptick and then there was another big groundswell of of inf interest in progressive rock music around about the start of 2003 2004 bands started coming through um and, you know and and in a lot of ways um uh, when i was working with tiny fish we rode that second wave with bands right. like frost and uh I'm just darwin's radio and i'm just trying to think of some of the other the other bands that were, were coming up and touchstone and uh there was oh, a yes. big up uptick of, of british uk uh progressive rock um and it was all centered um I, i'm sorry to diverge off here but the, oh, this no. is something which I, I i've managed to be there for this it was all centered around one venue in the uk which seemed to sort of like be the sort of um the center part of it which is a, a place called the peel um oh, and you yeah. had the classic rock society up in the north of england and yes. the peel was the the south southern hq um and all of a sudden like masses of bands like you know the pineapple thief and uh um and uh, i'm just trying to think of uh, who else that i've seen sort of like go through there um well you know we got lucky tiny fishes as i said we got lucky to go through there um and ride that wave um and um and it really did center for for a good sort of like five years on this one venue and it just about it i mean we even had uh pennsylvania band shadow gallery play a show there on on their european tour oh, and wow. uh, it just goes to show that there's a there's a huge you know it it became one of the important places to play like zutomir in in um uh, in the netherlands uh right. or, or the uh is it the 1860 uh club in in belgium as well so these classic little tiny yeah. little clubs which become focal points in the same way like um like the stone pony was uh, in in new jersey for so many bands that were passing through that was one of the right. the big sort of like places marillion played there and stuff um and um i just think it goes to show that um a genre goes in waves yeah and and maybe going back to what we were talking about with regards to 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 uh, to covid maybe there's a sort of a, a, that the wave is retreated during covid and we will see that influx once again of of new talent um after uh, you know hopefully when the venues start uh, really opening up and everybody feels safe enough to attend well we, you know like we're getting into a basically into a new decade so yeah. you know it seems to go in decades you know 
Yes, so, exactly right. Yeah. The Roaring Twenties were back again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You're going to have uh, Flapper, what's the Flapper Girls or something like that. <laughs> um, but no, uh, like I was going back, about, you know, when I got passionate about music, um, there was bits in, in the 80s, starting with uh, Rush Permanent Waves. Uh, yes. I, told, I tell this all the time. A friend of mine gave it to me on my birthday of that year. So the the cassette wasn't even out four months. Okay. It was, and he gave it, and I didn't know why he gave it to me because I don't I didn't think I gave him any indication that that's the music I like to listen to. But I think the guy had an idea that you know here I got to nudge him in the right direction. You know, yeah, and, and after that, I think I got the classic yes. Uh, I got Queen's greatest hits. Oh and, yeah, and the first uh, ELP cassette, and then the next one that I got when it came out on, I think no, it, it was already out. Um, Marillion's misplaced childhood because of the yeah. video, Kaylee. Yeah, that, that was, and uh. But then I went into a almost a different direction. Like uh, a friend of mine got me into thrash metal and things like of that. So I basically kind of the closed-minded version of me got rid of all those things so that I can go and buy, you know, these new things. You know, and it's like instead of like adding to it, I yeah. replaced yeah. it. And then I did that again when I got back into Prague in 93. I got rid of all the thrash stuff so that I can, you know, almost like I could finance getting all these these yeah. uh, bands. And I was like, it was like, but the, the, the one thing that really thrusted me into Prague more than anything was uh, Ink Crimson Red. Oh, really? When I was working at a uh, record store, um, and at the time that I was listening to Thrash Metal, I, I guess the manager got so tired of uh, me and this other guy putting that that kind of those band into the um, into the five disc CD changers, you know. Oh, yeah. And he goes, <laughs> and he goes, he goes, okay. He says, I got something for you. I think you're gonna like it because it has, I think it has everything that you're looking for. I put it on, and I'm like, not even a minute into it, I was like mesmerized, and I was like going, okay, this is it, and I told, after the thing finished, I said, okay, I want to buy that, it was, it wasn't a, no question whatsoever, I said, I want to buy that, and then I, you know, the manager there, he, he was like, kind of like the, um, he took me into this world of all different kinds of music that it's not just one kind. And, and it was just amazing, you know, and, and then on, it was, I, I call it the rabbit hole, just keep on going down and <laughs> getting more and more, as you can see behind me, you know, it's like, Hey, there's nothing wrong with that at all, to be honest with you. Actually, I do have a, a question for you, Ron, which is, sure. Um, this is basically based on the fact that I was, I'm was i nearly always late to the table when it comes to most bands. And I remember I only got into bands like Caravan, um, uh, you know, in the land of Graham Pink, sort of like in, in the 2000s. And I was going to ask you, was there was there any one band that you've come to love which you really came late in the day to? Um, one, one of them was Camel. Okay. Uh I got into them about 94 or 95 because there was a, a record store in uh, uh, in California. Uh, it was called Round Sounds. It was yeah. just this little tiny place, but he would um, the guy, he would let you listen. You know, if this was if this was in the case, uh, and you say, "Oh, what's that about?" He would take it out and put it in the CD player for you and play it and that's how i got into camel uh then that german band eloy oh yes yeah eloy. i mean th 
the, all these bands, you know, and it's like, okay, you know, it's like the, the doors are opening up wider and wider. Yeah. And it's like, now there's so much out there, you know, Facebook over the oh, yeah. past two years, you know, since, since there was no concerts, you know, people are now talking about what's in their collection. And, and I found more bands. I mean, one, one interesting band, I believe they're from Canada and their, their name is Zon, Z-O-N. Uh, okay. And, yes, I think and, I've heard of them. And they have, they have, closest thing I can describe them is a cross between Styx and Saga. Oh, right. Yes. It's in that, but it's like, it's power, pump, rock, and then it just has, you know, keyboards in it and, you know, some minor time changes, you know, and it's like, it's, it was just uh, all these just interesting bands. And then, of course, bands that, you know, we looked over the first time around, um, like, you know, I got a few back there, you know, like I, uh, Def Leppard, Judas Priest, mm -hmm. Chicago, you know. So it's like, you can't always get the music as it's coming out. You know, sometimes you will be late. It's funny you should make mention of Chicago because that was another one where I came late in the day to appreciating them. Because in the UK, the only time that we ever heard Chicago was the Peter Satira era during the 80s. So that, that sort of soft pop rock kind of thing and as a result because we didn't know anything about the 70s uh, version of chicago i just assumed that that's what chicago was right. and it was only uh, when um someone played me a little bit of the uh, the 70s stuff and i sort of said this is astonishing this is so so good this is totally different from that right that 80s hard habit to break kind of sort of you know um anthemic chorus type thing and there's nothing wrong with that either but i'm just you know i just never assumed that you often think of bands of, as only having one sort of like sound but if, when you think about bands like chicago and indeed you see see bands like king crimson have different eras in their sound as they go on it's fascinating and i'm kind of glad that um that i, I, I just was able to give them a second shake at the stick because I can't imagine how I would have been. I would have felt immensely shortchanged if I'd have only just felt found Chicago in the last years of my life. If you know what I mean. Right. I mean, my brother was listening to the to the soft era of, you know, the radio friendly era, and so that's what I knew of it. And then, um, and once in a while, on like classic rock, you know, they played the twenty five or six to four, you know, the, yeah. things like that. But it wasn't honestly until last year I, I found that box, the box set right, right here. Oh yeah, the first I think the first ten albums, and I found that for twenty dollars. And I'm nice. Like, oh. So I was like, going, okay, I'm gonna take a dive, and that was my introduction really to the, the full '70s version of the band, you know, and. It's night and day. I mean, oh, like yeah. you, see, like, <laughs> like you said, you know, it's you know, it's not that it's bad. It's just that it's so different that yeah. you know, you know, the experimentation that they were doing. You know, that's. I think that's with a lot of bands at the beginning. They're so hungry. They want to just try different things, and yeah. then once you know, if they get like in Chicago's. Uh, thing is they get to having radio hits and mtv hits you know that you know they tend to think okay now well let's go make money you know yeah. it's like you got two things you're gonna as a you know musicians you can either, either make art or you make money and yeah. very seldom do you get bands that can do both yeah yeah i think you're right i mean you get bands like uh as i said chicago um, King Crimson, um, and, and interestingly enough, sort of like a band a left a field of that, like band like Sparks, uh, as well, who have, oh, yeah. have had very different eras of their music as well. And uh, as a result, 
there's nothing quite like being able to dive back into a back catalogue and immerse yourself in music that you've never heard before. Exactly. It's it's I think that's one of the the best feelings in, in the world. It's like, you know, you just dive into a band and the and it's, if they have a, a nice size catalog and even even if they don't, if they just have a good albums that from start to finish you go, okay, once it's you got that finished the last song, I want to listen to it again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Exactly. You know, the, it's like those those things where it's like and then you can immerse yourself in the world, you, you know, like when a band does a concept album, you know, you can immerse yeah. yourself into what the story is. And you know, and I like I used to like when the bands kind of basically told me what was going on. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, okay, and now here's here's this thing, and you know, like get, holding your hand through the whole thing. But then now it's like, no, I want to hear it differently because everybody's going to hear something different. You yeah, know? yeah. It, it's funny you could make mention of that because um, uh, when I was working with uh, the guys in Tiny Fish, we had um, what kind of sort of like kept us apart from the from the crowd uh, with that is that we had um a gentleman called rob ramsey yes. robert ramsey who his thing was to do essentially we were we took the elements that genesis did uh, in the early days we we had a guy who dressed up on stage and came out and he delivered these really odd monologues sometimes in the songs sometimes between the songs as, as an introduction and it was i remember him talking about it when he was because he wrote most of the lyrics for tiny fish i wrote some of them but it was really basically his lyrical baby and um and one of the things which i i i heard him say is that as i became a, a more confident lyricist he said i decided that it was better for for both me as a, as a writer and for people as a listener to be less overtly specific about the subject matter and leave it open to interpretation yes. and so he started to build in a certain amount of ambiguity in his writing just to let people's imaginations run wild basically on the music that we did and i think that the music that tiny fish made was all the better for it and you can definitely hear that in um in the big red spark yes. and while there is a strong narrative going through there you can make your own interpretation about how that narrative works yeah and it just i gotta say his voice was very comforting you know it wasn't like obnoxious i mean some people if they wanted to be you know a ringmaster of sorts you know yeah. they would be like over the top but he was just you know it's like sitting there tell, telling the story to to you, you know, you're in the audience sitting and he's just, you know, aside from the video, I could just picture him just sitting there, um, leg crossed in a, in a big, big, nice chair, comfortable chair, and he has a book and he's reading what he's, uh, what his, um, his mom, you know, like he was in the monologue of what the story is about and he's reading it to you. So it's like every time I hear Big Red Spark, it's like that's when I how I'm picturing it. It it was so, it, it turned out to be a a, a real um, we, we weren't and this is the thing all the in my opinion all the best things tend to arrive unlooked for when we first uh, got Rob in with the band we only really expected him to do the monologue for the very first tune that we ever played which was uh, Motorville. And it has this intro section and we thought he'd just be the guy that wrote the lyrics like you know that sort of peter seinfeld sort of uh right um uh, kind of uh a vibe about him but we invited him on stage for that first time to do the intro and uh we suddenly realized that he, he was getting a bigger cheer whenever he turned up on audience to the audience than we did and so he started dressing up we started playing to that 
And right. uh, it became a, a sort of a big thing for him, sort of like when he'd walk on stage, we'd, get, we'd all brace ourselves and the, the cheer would go up as uh, as Rob walked on stage and, you know, dressed in his flight suit or in his, his, his military uniform or his... I, I, he, my favourite one of his was the Mayor of the Apocalypse, he called it, which was <laughs> this guy in a top hat and a suit and it was covered in dust um, because basically he, you know, he wanted to be the guy in charge of absolute chaos. That, right. was, that was his idea of it. And that was that, you know, we did this for a, a track called All Hands Lost. And that came always became my favorite character simply because he used to, he referred it to it as the mayor of the apocalypse. Right. right. And uh, I really liked that. That was fantastic. And again, it comes back to what we were saying earlier that um, when you can dive in to a band that you've been listening to, you know, that you've only recently come to, you get that opportunity to, to, sort of imprint your own life on on the music and that's where that's where i think all the best music happens when your imagination hits an artist's imagination and out of it you get something completely new that the neither the artist or the listener ever thought would happen now what about okay now obviously tiny fish was when you were in the uk Mm -hmm. um and now that you're here is your approach different than when you were in the uk you know because you have i mean obviously it's different people but then it's a different um climate if you yeah uh, uh, it it, it kind of is i i have um because i'm a, a a this is what i do for a living uh it's very much of a gig economy i have very my hands in a lot of different pies Right. Um, but my main live outlet has been this band called Tribe of Names, which was originally called Valdez, but we lost our keyboard player at the start of the pandemic, and it was his name, so he took it with him. So we oh. had to rename we, we we had to rename ourselves, and Tribe of Names was we thought was a, a really good name because we felt that way anybody could be in the band you know like the listener is part of the band you know it's just like it's a tribe of just of, of people you know right. and, and uh, we we all felt that uh, that would be a much more inclusive way of, of working um uh, and interestingly enough we um we're we're going to release we were due to release an album this year but because of logistical stuff and there's now a little bit of a supply chain issue with pressing plants there's a waiting yes. list so we're you know we're on an independent label we're not part of sony or anything like that. so we're at the end of a pretty long queue for the for the finite resources of pressing plants and what was going to be uh, an album our debut album released this year has now been pushed back to next year for the simple reason that there just isn't enough time you know to get everything printed up and uh and so um we uh we put together an album which I'd specifically written for the keyboard player. I wanted to write a keyboard album because I'd never done it before. And then he left. <laughs> so we were left with this keyboard album and no keyboard player. Um, and so we were very lucky that we we were put in contact with, or we, we happened to know a guy called uh, Carl Eisenhart, who's in yes. a band a, a, a band in, in Pennsylvania here called Pinnacle. Yes. Um, and he's an incredibly gifted guitarist um and what he essentially did is he rewrote all of the keyboard parts for guitar oh wow. uh, you know all of these incredibly extended chords where you know i've got 11 fingers <laughs> or, you know uh, you know and an, and an elbow on the keyboard making right. these really deep chords and he he reinterpreted it for the for the guitar so um hopefully you'll be able to hear hear it next year it'll be coming out i think early in 2022 now um but it's um uh that is very much closer to the music that i was writing in tiny fish now because we in tiny fish we had no keyboard player we used guitar synths and um various different bits of trickery to sort of like mimic the kind of sounds that 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 your keyboard player would do and you know today's modern technology will allow you to do that because essentially what is a keyboard except a a person pressing a switch uh, right making a sound really at the end of the day certainly when it comes to synthesizers so we figured that that was probably the way forward and it's come around again with tribe of names and we're 
I've gone back to that kind of thing. So this band is is probably the closest thing I've 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 written in that kind of tiny fish style um, right. for over for, for close to a decade. And it kind of feels good to be back in that sort of like that kind of thing because I understand it. I understand how that works live on stage and all of the guys in the band, I've got uh, um, a great bunch of bandmates uh, with me. I've got a guy called um, Scott um, uh, Miller, who is uh, was in uh, a, a band called Stone Cold Ballers over here. I've got, uh, we've got Carl, as I've already spoken about, and we've also got um, Tom Hyatt, who was uh, a ex of Echolin, um, a bass yes. player in Echolin. Um, and uh, it's a really cool uh, band and we've been doing YouTube uh, concerts uh, for the yeah. past year. You can see that we've got a YouTube page in Tribe of Names. Just look it up. And uh, oh, yeah. so we put on like one, one, we play one song a week um, and you can see us doing sort of various different sort of, we do covers and we do some of our own material as well. And uh, we set ourselves up with our own little um, live venue, which we've got cameras set up around as well. Um, and, you know, and that hopefully will be the next chapter. And right now, uh, unfortunately, I, I feel a little bit like I'm, I'm giving the world a bit of a sort of progressive blue balls by by, uh, <laughs> by mentioning it because I've got no music to show you uh, unless you want to go to the YouTube page. You can see as we played all of the album that is going to be released in 2022 live in our studio. Um, so it's if you ever want to sort of hear some of the, the tracks. That oh, yeah, I'll, I'll put the link down below. When... Yeah. But it's it's fun. It's it's nice. It's I'm getting back into that kind of sort of tiny fishy kind of vibe now. But on this side, of the Atlantic with American musicians, right? Yeah, you know, um, it's uh, I I do notice a difference with uh, American prog bands and then British and then European, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's, to me, that's great because then now you got different, you know, I don't like it when they're trying to almost copy note for note something that they heard from, you know, from the 70s or from the 80s, you know, trying to be a, a, an exact duplicate of it. You know, I like to hear different, you know, you know, like when you listen to a band from, you know, England or, or Scotland or Ireland, you hear differences based on um, not society, but um, their background, you know, because yeah. you'll, you'll hear it just there. And then when you come over here to the United States, you know, you have in, you have the New England area then you got the south you got the midwest and you got the east at the west coast so you have different you know how they approach you know back in the 70s you know you had kansas you know kansas didn't sound like um you know any one of the ba other bands that came out yeah you know they i always i always cite kansas and ambrosia as being the two uh, first american progressive rock bands to go let's just sound like us let's not try and be like the, a european uh, uh prog band let's let's not be a genesis not not be let's be us yeah and that's why i i had to ask on my face i said you know to the singers it's like do you is it your natural voice or you're trying to sound like someone because i'd remembered in the 90s it's like either the singers were trying to sound like Gabriel, Phil Collins, or John Anderson. You know, I mean, there's other, but those were the three ones that everybody was trying to mimic, you know, in a way. And while that was fun at the beginning, but then when there's so many of them, and it's like, you know, I want to hear the voice that was your voice, not to trying to sound like someone else to, you know, to get um, notoriety or something like that, you yeah. know, that to get, to get, you know, okay, if I sound like Peter Gabriel, I'm going to get all those fans, 
you know, and, and it's like, I like it when people, you know, your voice, for example, you know, a very, it doesn't sound like anybody else. It sounds like naturally coming out. Um, there's quite a few others like that, you know. I have brother, to say your that brother, he, your brother too. I mean, yeah, it's like, yeah. He he he's actually surprised me. My brother's uh, he never sung in uh, when we were back in the eighties when we were we were in a little band when we first started out and we like we supported IQ and we were like you know fanboys really back in the day. But right. we managed to get to play alongside people like um, Jeff Mann of Twelfth Night, IQ, Jadis, um, and we were we were at that tail end of the eighties really, um, and and. Jem showed no interest at the time in singing, none at all. Um, and when I heard him, I thought, he's got a great voice. I love his singing. It's fantastic. And again, yeah, you can hear the uh, um, you can hear that, that, you know, he has his own style. He has his own kind. Oh, of yeah. Vibe. That's the one thing was another band that I got in into in the 90s, uh, you know, well after that he had passed that. A friend of mine said, okay, you like IQ, you know, like these. And, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, I mean, I always thought of um, Twelfth Night as the more grittier of the of those yeah. 80s bands. Definitely the darkest prog band out of the entire lot. Oh, yeah. With the exception of when uh, Palace had uh, Ewan. Doing oh yes, the, yeah, the Ripper. Ripper. Yeah, it, the Ripper. it's funny you. Sh it's funny you should mention that because I mean I love uh, that that first um, that first Palace album and, and you an incredible frontman, absolutely fantastic frontman. But I would I would probably point to Alan Reed, his successor, as being the guy that probably influenced me most as a singer. I remember seeing them at the at the was as was the Hammersmith Odeon. And they were uh, supporting uh, an EP just before their uh, album The Wedge came out, and they right. they had an EP called The Night Moves EP. And I'm not kidding you that I listened to that EP probably more than any other bit of vinyl back during the uh, the, the the mid '80s. It was so so influential, and uh, and I I I managed to meet um, Alan, um, and I know Alan. Uh, reasonably well now both on the internet and in real life and he is a lovely bloke and he he has this voice that one of the in my opinion one of the best voices in 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 progressive rock and uh uh if there was one uh vocalist that probably influenced me the most as a as a singer of progressive rock it's probably alan reed yeah it's very good i i I, I liked how it's just something about the, his delivery of the song and it's like so, so much passion in it. Yeah. Without, without him really overdoing it. He's, yeah, he's got an incredibly strong and powerful voice. Yeah, and because um, I, they had, um, not only did they have their live video in the same uh, place that Poland, but they also yep. had one previous and um i got to talk with with a couple of them um but i i got to talk with mike yeah uh, yeah and, and uh i know i always, i don't say it the correct way but you know the american version ram but it, yeah, it's Graham in in the, Graham. In the UK. Yeah, Graham. And then uh, Ewan, I got they they, yeah, yeah. they snuck him in. <laughs> I wasn't expecting hey. that. You know, I said, "Hey, that would be nice." You know, he said, "Well, I don't know if we can get Alan, but maybe I can get someone else." You know, it's like okay. Uh, but you're 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 absolutely right that that Ewan and Jeff Mann were of a kind in in you know that yes. they they were drawn to to much darker themes. Um, yes. And uh, I also think that um, uh, Jeff Mann had a voice unlike any of the others. I, I was very lucky recently to um, be approached by the guys in Twelfth Night to remix one of the tracks uh, for a, a new 
uh, album uh, that's coming out and like people like I, you know I, uh, like Andy Tillerson from uh, from The Tangent and yes. uh, Stephen Wilson uh, has done a remix so we were all sort of like invited to do this and I got to to remix one of the tracks and so me as a fan as a as a young boy listening to Jeff Mann and now being able to hear the isolated tracks um my with my producer hat on right. I had to sort of like you know think well how do how can I improve this and I'm not kidding you I hardly needed to touch his vocals there was not he was in tune he had this vibe about him and I thought to myself this is again I got the goosebumps when I was listening to his voice even just in isolation just right. to hear Jeff Mann singing that was a big thrill for me oh yeah yeah uh Again, you know, there's one of those bands that I don't even think they came stateside when he was with them. Um, I think maybe later on they did. Um, but it's like all the, that's why it's like I lived through YouTube of, of people uh, putting up their own personal uh, videos of, of those older bands, uh, you know, like with some old clips of IQ. I mean, yeah. IQ, you know, if you're saying dark, they did kind of get a little dark with uh, uh, Enemy Smacks. Yes. I mean, I think that, there was that a lot of, of that. Back, back in the UK, there was a lot of sort of st what, what Fish referred to as street lyrics, yeah. where they were, they were in, you know, there was less about the swords and sorcery and science fiction and more about everyday things that that we all had to meet in our lives like the drug problems the unemployment and stuff but they did it in a you know and, and just like social pressure and i think a lot of that comes from sort of the the roger waters uh kind of writing the wall and like the final cut animals all that kind of you know and you know all the way back to um uh some of the earlier works as well where where yeah you know it it's a, it, these are songs about confronting who you are and and the world around you, right? And I think a lot of that, um, you know, sort of filtered into uh, the progressive rock of the of the early eighties. Certainly in the UK as well, it was a it was a very dark time. Oh yeah, they um, I'm trying to remember the band, and they're they're from America, but um. They they did an album, just a one-off thing, and it was um, I can't remember the name of the band, but I'll probably remember it afterwards. But <laughs> it's always the way. They, <laughs> they did not sound like they were from America, you know. I think for a while, some, uh, they were on. I'm not sure if you remember a guy named Greg Walker. He had a, a symphonic. Records. Okay, he he had he had uh, I guess put the the LP onto a CD, mm -hmm. and um, for the longest time people were in the or the the internet when we had the IRC and those yes. little channel those yeah. little channels you know uh, what was that rec dot aggressive and think you know where people were basically. <laughs> biting each other you know like you, you know and um there was a big art i might not remember there was a big argument where are these guys from and then when people would say oh they were from america no they're not you know and it's like yeah they are. you know it's like it just but they they were in the early 80s so they actually they their style fit in with uh iq you know yeah palace and uh 12th night it fit into that area and you know so it's like it just amazing i mean but i don't think that they were copying it it just i think it, it really it sounded just probably natural. felt natural to them yeah and so it's like i mean you get i think you get those isolated things where it's like um that it happens you know, and well, you say that. I mean, I think that there's a there, you know, um, Echolin do an incredible uh, sort of a, a twist on that because, again, a lot of their root uh, lyrics are rooted in the real world. Uh, yes. I've been I've been fortunate enough to 
to uh, both play alongside, share a stage and work with um, the guys uh, variously in Eklin, Ray Weston, the, the singer, he's an astonishing, that man's a great lyricist, a fabulous performer, always worth a look-see. Um, and of course, um, Brett, who is, you know, Brett, both Brett and Chris, who are essentially the, the musical engine room of Eklin, right. they often have um, some, you know, some dark themes, which they, they share with uh, in, 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 uh, in the songs that they write. And I think that that, they were also another band that, especially during the 90s, I was particularly drawn to because yeah. they had just about everything you could possibly wish from a band um, playing music with, you know, with an extended range of, of instruments. Uh, and they they were very challenging with their arrangements. They were very, I mean, even to this day, um, albums like um, uh, The End Is Beautiful and May are uh, you know they can they can route me to the spot with some of the uh, the music that oh, they yeah. that they've uh, recorded over the years. Oh yeah, I I got to see them just before they put out. Um, um, let's see, where is it? Um, As the world. Oh yeah. Just before they put that out um, at that Prague Fest. I believe it was 94 or maybe 95. Yes, I've seen the video for that. They were absolutely on fire at the round about that time. Oh, yes. And I was sit, sitting uh, about a few seats down. There was this older gentleman. Now, at the time, I'm in my 30s, so he was probably in, in his late 50s. Mm -hmm. And he was like going, these, these guys are too loud. You know, it was, it was covering his ears. And I'm not going... I had the big grin on my face, like going, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I said, you know, I almost, I didn't want, I didn't want to be disrespectful to him, but I kind of wanted to sell him to say, hey, you, you know, it's progressive rock. Are you going to expect rock? You know, and they were the loudest without being distorted. Yeah. They were the loudest and the most energetic yep. at that festival that year. And I, I'm sure I always, I always remember. Um, I can't remember if it was Tom that said it, um, but we were we were talking about um, the sort of days back in Eklund. You know, you get a, if you've got a member of an ex member of, of of a band like that, it, you get to to hear sort of like a different side of it. And one of the things that he's he's always been very very positive about his experience in that band, and sort of like he's always really valued his time in that band. But he did say, I said, you know, that back in those days, these songs were incredibly challenging to play. And he said, yeah, I know. And he said, and we could play them at the drop of a hat. He said, we'd rehearsed them so much and played them so much live on stage that it meant, you know, nothing for us to play stuff in compound time with in complex sort of like chord structures and harmonies and stuff. And it just felt completely natural to us because we were totally immersed in the music back then and i remember sort of like watching the video of them at prog day and i think there's some also some video the very first time i ever saw them play live was actually on the dvd that came with the as the world reissue yes and it's them um and i didn't know this at the time but they were playing a show in detroit with a metal band who were the headliners and they were right. they were they were on the, the same bill as um discipline discipline were also playing that night right. and i i remember sort of like seeing these guys playing this music and it's like it's all live they did it you know and i yeah. i could not and i became around about the start of the 2000s a little bit evangelical about um Echelin, sort of like right. saying you've got to hear these guys you've got to hear these guys oh um, yeah that may, maybe pushing it a bit too much well, the you know when they did May with that um, with a little the added uh, band, band yeah. to it, you know that was it took it took that album to a whole different level, you know, because that that's one of those albums that it's like fifty minutes, but when you listen to it. It doesn't feel like it. No, it doesn't. No, it, they they produced a classic piece of music there, I, and I remember that um, Tom wasn't in the band for for that period when they were doing. He joined not soon after they released May. We joined the band, 
And one of the things he's always said about um, May is that he's very thankful in some ways that he wasn't in the band at that time. He said, because I got to be a fan for the very first time. I, I wasn't involved in the music, so I got to listen to it the way a fan listened to Echolin. And he said, right. I've always been, you know, I, I rejoined the band shortly after that, but I've always been very thankful that I got to hear May without that being, you know, I always, again, um, I always remember um, uh, uh, David Gilmore saying, I wish I could have heard Dark Side of the Moon for the first time the way a fan would have heard it. I've never got that experience because I was in the band. And so, yeah, so Tom managed to get that kind of experience for that one uh, album. And I, I genuinely think, um, looking back to it, they they came back from from that um, the, the time with Sony after Sony um you know screwed them over um, yeah they came back stronger and as better yeah, I, I, and as better writers in my opinion for having that experience i i don't know whether or not it's you could say the school of hard knocks made them better but they it just goes to show the resilience they had as, as a band oh, yeah. yeah oh yes yeah that um those two bands always almost always and then still yeah. and then Chris's uh, band, uh, Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage, uh, yes. I mean, just two different sides of Echo, and then when they came back together, they, they brought both of those sides in strong, I think stronger, you yeah. know, because yeah. this sorry, was the band I'm that sorry, I was Ron. selling. Ah, oh, yes, Netherworld, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I could talk about Eklund for the rest of the afternoon. I apologize. I have to take my fanboy <laughs> hat, hat off there. <laughs> There's just so much. I mean, like like we're saying, you've got the, so much mu music out there, you know, the and, you know, for you, you, you came from the British side, and then now you're incorporating what you know in, with American musicians and, you know, you know, and creating something completely different, you know. So I feel I, very you know, lucky. I mean, there are not, you know, we, I, I don't wish to bring things down, but sort of like you just never know when the light's going to get um, uh, extinguished. You have to live for the day because obviously with, with the tragic loss of, of David Longdon out of uh, yes. Big Big Train, uh, and going back to Jeff Mann, losing Jeff Mann as well, um, it was, you know, it just goes to show that you have to appreciate the moments as they're coming for the exactly. simple reason that we might never see them again. Exactly. You know, and um, I had never seen Big Big Train, so, you know, and obviously not Twelfth Night either, you know, but you can see there, especially with the technology with uh, YouTube, the, the, a lot of bands are putting out, you know, like Tribe of Names putting their stuff out there, you know, for people to to get a glimpse into what the band is all about, you know, especially when you do the little the kind of the I like the ones that they did. Uh, they call them the lockdown videos, where the, you know you had the different boxes of different people. I, yeah. I mean, those were fun to watch. The different bands doing that, and musicians were doing that. Yeah. Um, well, it's a willingness to thrive under extreme circumstances. Yeah. You know, and again, I, sort of like you know, it's it, sooner or later, you know, bad things happen to good people, and we're all in those kind of situations that sooner or later, and and it, it does come down to the fact that you you have to do everything you can to persevere and to survive exactly. it because what are the choices there exactly yeah. exactly um uh you know i think we're gonna you know we both predicted there's gonna be a big amount of music coming out yeah. you know so it's it's what I think it falls under. Uh, be careful what you wish for, you know, on the band side. You know, oh, I yeah. wish we had more stuff. Well, I think it's going to come, and people. Are, oh yeah, 
Yeah, I think you there know. is definitely going to be a sort of, uh, well, I, I say there's definitely, it's my prediction that there's going to be, like yourself, uh, uh, it was going to be an uptick of, of new music in, in over the next year, 18 months. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, I th- and that's going to be fantastic. And then, of course, and slowly doing into uh, the live shows again, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to have a lot of small shows like, you know, d- like what Discipline did. Um, yeah. Thing, uh, things like uh, Prog Stock. Uh, Rossfest is going to be po- probably, Rossfest and that Cruise City Edge are going to be probably the biggest ones that are going to happen yeah. next year. Yeah. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot of small, smaller, isolated thing, you know, gigs, you know. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, I think, um, you know, as with all things, music is changing right now. The world is changing around it and we will adapt accordingly. Um, I, I certainly, I attended and was lucky enough to play at the very first prog camp that they had in um, northern uh, New Jersey not yeah, too I long ago. Of- and there was us, there was um, uh, uh, the um, uh, it was the guys from the Tea Club, and they're another band which I absolutely adore, the Tea Club. They're a fantastic band. Um, and, and there was Rise Twain, which is sort of a, sort of, uh, sort of a, a mixture of, of, of bands, sort of like some from Echolin, some, some from other bands sort of like come together. And they, they sort of like play a much more sort of like a, 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 a kind of much more rootsy kind of of, yeah. of music and uh, and i i mean i love those as, as, again and they just had a recent another one the, the prog camp and uh, one of my mates um jason is in a band called orpheus nine they're another band to watch um uh, in you know over the next uh, few years i definitely uh, put them in the uh, uh, in the bubbling under category right oh there's so many there's so many of them I know, I know, and it's it's a it, to be honest with you, it these are the kind of things you want to have happen, isn't it? Really, yeah. when you think about it. Oh yeah, the more the more, how do they say? The more the merrier. No, yes, get, that's it. <laughs> I mean, and 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 it's even better that all these bands don't sound alike. No. So you get so it's not like okay, okay, I'm going to get a bunch of bands that sound like you know, whatever you know, just oops. It's like each one has an individual personality of what, you know, that like, you know, you got anywhere from, you know, the ones that get really aggressive with it. Yeah. Uh, people that, uh, like, you know, I'm really glad that Discipline reissued or remixed that. Yeah. Because I've been listening to that one a lot. And that, I mean, that was a favorite of mine when it first came out. And yeah, well, just... it's it's Mark, it's Mark and Rayner up at uh, up in Chicago, uh, which I, I I think also have to sort of like you know we ought to stick our hands up and thank them because they were the oh, guys yeah. behind putting this uh, re-releasing it on and re and remastering it. Terry Brown was involved in the remastering process um, uh, of that album, and uh, uh, they 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 put on a lot of miles going round various places. You know, literally during this year in the car, going from like place to place to 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 get the the, the word out and the vinyl out uh, in support of this concert, and they've put in a lot of time and effort. Uh, Mark and Rainer up at progrock.com to get this uh, out into the real world. So you know, I I, I you know, it, it, thanks should be said, you know, or, or passed to them as well because they they put a lot of work into it. Oh yeah, Mark Mark was mentioning a lot. When it when it first uh, it first decided to do it, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, that's gonna, you know, I can already imagine how much. Okay, they're gonna make this great album even greater, you know. And it's like, and like I made, I mentioned that you know the new mix is almost like you're listening to it for the first time. Yes, because there's new sounds coming out, and it it just feels like it's brand new music even though it's 97 so it's like you know quite a bit ago (laughs) well you know to be really honest with you there's nothing wrong with i mean i've 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 often sort of said that you know 
I always like to look forward and, and get on to the next project, but I don't wish to dismiss anything that I've done in the past because, as you say, it's open to reinterpretation. When you see, when you listen to a piece of music when you're a young man, it can mean something, or a young person, like rather, you can mean something completely different uh, to you then as it does now. And so as a result, you know, music, even sort of 30 years, 40 years ago, can reinvent itself because of how you interpret it as an older individual. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there. I don't know if it's a myth, but I always, uh, a lot of people have mentioned years ago to me that a lot of times you do return to the first point of your mute of your musical journey. You always re do return to that because maybe out of nostalgia, but times, you know, you listen to that album when you were in your teens and then now listen to it again in your 50s. You know, it's like you have your life experiences and you now you can hear that album again. You know, some, some albums stand, stand the test of time and some of them, they kind of, they They're were a stuck. moment in time. Yeah, a moment. And then it's like, you know, I have that feeling more for like movies that, you know, seen it yeah. once, that's it, you know, move on, you know. But yeah. but then there's stuff where you see or want to listen to it again and again. And, you know, those are the, the per I think, I like the like, perfect moment in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's, it is interesting that, um, and I suspect you, you and everybody out there has probably had that moment where they've listened to an album and found something new in the mix. Oh, I didn't realize there was a guitar there doing that thing, or I didn't realize there were backing vocals doing something there, or those, those are the little sort of like discoveries that you find long after that you think that that, that sort of seam of, of 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 music has been mined out and and all of a sudden you find something new to sort of wonder over i mean it's one of the things which um uh, i was part of a um a podcast called tabletop genesis for about um five years and uh during my time and, and stacy's time on the program it was myself um a guy called mike lord a guy called tom roche um and uh there was um uh, uh, my my wife Stacy as well, um, and and Ellie as well. She was uh, um, she was on the the program, and we went through track by track every single Genesis album, every single Genesis studio album, and some of the solo albums as well. And we broke them down track by track per episode. We would do, uh, you know, sort of selling England by the pound will be its own episode and um, Duke will be its own episode. And, you know, we actually had to split the lamb into two episodes. Cause right. it was so, that's a lot to get your head around. But in doing that, we had to go back and listen to these albums, albums, which I thought I knew well, but when you go play it back as, with a critical ear, all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of stuff that you never realized was there yeah. both musically and lyrically oh he's saying that oh they're playing this exactly and it is fascinating that's one of the reasons why i think you know music will always be an evolving dynamic thing because it interacts with the per person that's listening with it oh yeah yeah and and then when you get the ones that are, you know when they remix it where they're bringing those uh musical instruments that were just buried for whatever reason you know they got buried, you know, and you got a crap mix. Yeah, they get a, and then all of a sudden they got this great mix, and it's like, you know, it's like I, you know, like you were saying, I don't remember that guitar or that, you know, maybe a horn or a keyboard or something. You know, you don't. Re that's where it's like a rediscovery. That's you know, like with this discipline album, it's just a rediscovery of it, and yeah. uh, it's. You know, I, that's one of, from the 90s is, I would say, I think, ones that I would always listen to. And I, I think I listened to that to death, the original mix, and now I'm listening to the remix to death. So it's like, you know, it's like, 
but it's it, it's nice when you can get music that it's um in a way it's kind of part of not only the band's dna but it's a part of their fans dna yeah and you know it's like a certain point okay that's when i first heard it and you know it took me in such a way you know that you know you could the other other stuff just almost felt like it in through one ear and out the other oh, you know yeah. it just oh it just, yeah it has no some music just had, didn't have enough substance you know and it didn't and it didn't really i mean there's some progressive rock stuff that that it almost felt like there were you know doing it by you know by the numbers or you know they they didn't have any depth to it they didn't have any emotion but they were it was just like carbon copies you know there's a yeah. lot of those out there and it's it's well, very nice when people can you know i i understand it's a, it's it's not an easy thing to some create something original yeah and for some you, listeners for some listeners they want the wheel reinvented for them they don't really want new stuff they just want variations on a theme that's perfectly cool as well the bottom oh, yeah. line here is that if it puts a smile on your face that's all the reason you need to to to, to listen to music um as an artist you'll find that the vast majority of artists want to put their own personal stamp on on music and um i suppose it just goes to show that um there are very few acts that can break through in, into the big time especially nowadays um into sort of like wider public consciousness right. because um a the, the the music industry is structured a lot differently nowadays and b um you have to adjust your expectations you know it it i won't i won't say that uh, that the old uh, older bands effectively pulled the ladder up behind them but it's a lot easier to play with um uh, a style if you're first through the door if you know what i mean right and also too um you know things nowadays have changed and it's uh, with how people are listening to their music, you know, first, you know, obviously first you had the LP and the A track and the cassette, and then we mm -hmm. got the CD, which in my own personal opinion was the best format because I can get back to, you know, if I can remember the, the time stamp, I can get back to that area a lot easier than, um, I mean, the worst one I thought was the eight track. <laughs> I thought that was the worst. I mean, I had one of those little portable machines. I had a yeah. couple eight tracks, and and if and it was a touch machine. If you hit two, you know, try to turn it on, and it jumps to the next song. I said, no, I want to start. <laughs> and um, and then of course you got digital. Yep. Of and, course. and and then the newest thing the past five or so years streaming yeah and, and of course the thing is is that it won't stay still it, you know the, the fact of the matter is that we're talking about streaming now as the latest thing that will happen it'll move on from there as well that the, the, right. the you know and also you're seeing the resurgence of vinyl now um, oh, yes. a huge resurgence of vinyl um and it, which pleases me no end because for me personally that really was the era i I, I I harken back to with the warmest, with the most affection. Um, well, that, but the, you know, that, that's, you know, the way you're describing it, it's, is a more, a genuine reason for wanting vinyl, but then you get these, I hate using the word hipsters that get in it because, <laughs> ah, okay, it's a cool thing to have, you know, what do you get? You know, it's like, I personally, I mean, man, I would love to have some vinyl, but, you know, I barely have enough room for the CD. So the vinyls <laughs> are in a bigger package. So that's going to be a little bit, you know, but I'm thinking one day to get like a nice small little system and just maybe get a select, you know, go look through what I got here and see if something, oh, I want to have that vinyl experience with 
a particular album. I, I think it comes down to the fact that there's a much more tactile experience with an album. I don't know whether or not you've had this, but there is there's a big difference in holding a version of topographic oceans in your hand as a cd as it does with the gatefold and the full uh roger dean experience when you open it up and all of a oh, sudden yeah. you're stepping into a world yeah um and and i think that that's of you know i had the same thing when when i bought the lamb lies down as well with the uh with the, <laughs> the 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 inscrutable writings of peter gabriel on the inside and trying to make sense of of how that album is 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 worked out and um, right. but i think that um with regards to uh sort of like you know the hipster generation i guess there are going to be some people that will buy vinyl or they'll buy anything because it's cool but you right. know that out of that percentage of hipsters there will be a few who will get it yeah they'll understand what was so special about it and that that they will make them i always remember uh billy connolly the comedian billy connolly when he yeah. had a tattoo made the guy that wrote the tattoo when he finished doing the tattoo he said ah, one less of them one more of us and that really <laughs> sort of like it sort of sums up in my opinion what it's like to listen to um that classic era of, of the 70s and 80s on vinyl it's sort of like even if it's only a few of them it'll be one less of the hipsters and one more of the people that truly do understand yeah. what, where the value lies in these these old formats oh yeah the um i appreciate that you know there's i i love listening to uh whether it's on a podcast or someone writing on Facebook, you know, when they got got a, an album of a classic band and different, you know, different genres. And it's like just the, for me, the pleasure of getting CD, now I can, I can really picture how when someone gets the album of it and then open it, you know, like a gatefold, open it up or, and first of all, you get to, the lyrics are a little bit bigger, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and and the artwork, and it's like yes, it's always like okay, that's why you know the one thing that got me really in, I, I was so surprised that they would someone would do it is you know, Frost, you know the Thirteen Winters, you know that box set. I mean, I mean in this day and age to go. With that much work and and um, art, everything that went into it, it's like I mean that that's the the feeling of you know you get that physical media, whether it's a CD, album, box set, you know, or if you go again, into, it's an immersive experience, isn't it? Oh yeah, yes. So that's like going to the streaming. Now, I think the streaming perfect in a perfect way would be in conjunction with you know the on media. the money yes yeah it should be in conjunction it should be a way of um exploring and uh and giving you a glimpse into okay yeah I, now i listen to this song of this new band i never heard before now my choice is do i dive in mm. you know and where yeah, do i you have buy to it? remember that that that, that it, you know it's a disruptive technology and people forget that it not only changed the music industry um irrevocably it also essentially killed fm radio as well because there is no you know no one listens to fm radio now it's it we all do it on on the um you know on on the on on the net now on the web yeah. And there's another side of this, which is, I think, uh, for me personally, I will never value the streaming service as much for the simple reason that one of the things that buying a physical uh, product will give you is a sense of possession of that yes. music. And there's a sense of, you know, when I look back at my, my CDs or my vinyl or, or whatever it is, or my, my DVDs, that's if the apocalypse happens tomorrow i've still got that 
Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. The internet, the internet will be gone, you know, that I will still have when I'm sitting around my fireside fending off zombies from the apocalypse. <laughs> I, I can listen to my, you know, if there's electricity, admittedly. Um, but I, you know, I have it. That that's that's a physical product. It's exactly. in my possession. You know what I mean? Yeah. And in, in a way, you own it. Now, what is with the streaming, someone basically said, it's kind of like renting. Yeah. Yeah. You don't own it. So it's like if that group, that band and that album that you say you love you know and i put that in air quotes yeah that you love and then all of a sudden it disappeared and then you hear that then you hear the people going why did they take it away why did you know yeah it's a i i always whenever they say that whether it's music or movies i said one word to them licensing yes money <laughs> i said that's why it's no longer there yeah because someone got greedy on either side and basically the other side just said okay i'll go take it somewhere else yeah. you know and but when you have the physical copy you know, like you said if the internet goes down i mean i know nowadays people if they get a digital version of an album that they put it on their cloud yeah. But what if for some fluke that cloud gets uh wiped? Yeah. Yeah. Where is you know, you spend nine ninety nine for an album. Basically that you might as well have taken that ten dollars and put it in the toilet or yeah. in the trash. Yeah. Because you basically lost that. Yeah, and you, you know? only have to see that with uh, you know, um uh like you know franchise properties moving from platform to platform you know back in the day you buy a dvd you could watch that whenever you want but you know nowadays you can turn on netflix and the stuff that you love is no longer there exactly they took it off you know and so yeah there, there there's a sense of sort of certainly for me uh there's a sense of empowerment when you buy a physical product because then, of course, it's down to you whenever you want to listen to it. You're not, you know, subservient to uh, to some big company. Um, well, see, I put you... this. See, I put this in the in my computer. Yeah. And then I download it to this. Yeah. There in, you are. In my for my car, you know, because honestly, I mean, it's a convenience because yes. I'm not going to bring in ten yeah. CDs into my car. You know, I mean, granted, before all this, that's what you had to do. Yeah. You know, and I think I was lucky about about 2004. I had a car that actually had a six CD changer. Oh you know, God, yes, those car. things. <laughs> and so I was loading them up, and it's like at the time, you know, the person I was with, okay, we got a, okay, six, okay, I get three, and you get three. You know, yeah. it's like, and um, the one common thing that we had was the Beatles. You know, that was, yep. Whatever album we picked, okay, that was almost like that was that was our common ground, so to speak, you know. Yes. And, yeah. But you know, it's and also too getting physical media helps the artist, you know, in the future to decide their next album are they going to release it? Because I I'm hearing like a fifty fifty thing nowadays where some artists are just releasing. A digital version of their album on Bandcamp, or you know, and I, their... I, I have been, I've been that guy for the simple reason that the expediency allows me to do that. Because one of the things which people often say to me is, uh, "Why haven't you released this on CD?" And I say, "Well, if you've got the money to front for me to release X number of, because uh, it's a, it's a gamble, it's a bet." And I, I can tell you right now, there are a legion of of, of, uh, of musicians out there who have put their things on CD because people say they wanted it and then have 500 CDs sitting in their garage for the rest I have, of the band. I spoke with someone about that same thing, um, a band, uh, Little Atlas. Oh, yes. And he, and he said, he, uh, Steve said, I found, uh, you remember they used to come in those little, long cartons yeah know, yeah yeah maybe what about 50 or something like that he says i found i think he said he found four cartons 50 so that's 200 cds 
yeah. they've been there since uh, the album was released. So I, I, I get that. You know, I understand that it's the money to do those things. And, but then, you, you know, like, you know, Ross doing that, that huge thing, you know, who would have thought? I mean, you know, but I think when, maybe. What, sorry, carry on. Yeah, who would have thought? I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, bands like Giraffe putting out this in a little little box with uh, in the seat in the sleeves. Mm-hmm. You know, those that would have been more economical, but they chose to do it that way because I think they felt that. You make mention of this, though. I think that that's another way that um, streaming has changed the physical products of music because people are now, you you can't, gigs don't happen now. If you want a gig to be a gig and a well-attended gig, it has to be an event. You'll see so many bands like say, we'll do an album in its entirety. That makes it an event. It's the same with albums. It's very hard to convince people to part with cash nowadays for just a simple CD because the culture is is, is fading in that respect. So yeah. you'll find a lot of bands are now moving to that event format in box sets, in deluxe editions, in yeah. in sets which have you know reissues and remastering. We you know on vinyl you know we were talking about discipline uh, a few months ago and i think that that is probably going to be the way forward now for people if we were going to release like for example i have i have a side project called tide house i've really fi- released five albums through uh through bandcamp uh because you know these are and it's it's actually been the most commercially successful thing I've ever done in career in my career as a, as a sort of as a, as an artist, and uh, there's now talk of people of coming to me and saying we might release all of these as CDs in a box set because that's what people like nowadays. They like yeah. their collections, um, and yeah. so as a result, I think you're going to find that that is going to become a more important avenue of of uh, of, of, of of musical product than just the single CD album tour kind of thing now right right i mean i you know some some of them were very uh one of the ones that i i got you know during the pandemic was this where he uh eddie jobson did oh the, yes yeah where he did that and it yeah. came came with a blu-ray you know most of them seem to be coming with dvds yeah uh, 5.1 mix. Now, I don't have a great system, but when I put it on my Blu-ray player and I listened to it in the headphones, it was, again, it was one of those things uh, you hear it for the very first time. You, it's like, it's sonically, things are going on. And I felt like, I kind of in a way felt dizzy because I think all these things were going on that before, you know, I used to hear it coming out of two speakers. Now it's it's basically I'm surrounded by it. You know? Yes, yes. And it's like I felt very dizzy, so I had to sit down while I was listening to it. It's like, I mean, yeah, you know, I think you pretty much said how it's going to be. You know, I mean, there's going to be bands that are going to release the single CDs. I mean, and then there's going to be bands, you know. Like Frost, that released a box set, uh, Transatlantic. Retrospectives, did, did, basically. Yeah, and uh, Transatlantic that did, did two versions of their of their album. So basically, in a sense, it's a box set, but split up in a way. Yes. Yeah. So it's like you know you have all those things. I mean, it, you just have to be creative with the format now because the format as it was back during the eighties and the nineties no longer interest the vast majority of people who want to listen to their music. So there's a sort of like, you know, there's a, it's a double edged sword. Um, it's, it's changed it in, in two very major ways. It's changed it in the delivery and the appreciation of how we, we like our music. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not going to stay the same forever. It's a constant moving target. Yeah. Uh- so when I was talking to months ago, they were basically saying that, you know, it's just the same as how right now 
rock based music is underground while there's the more you know electronic mm -hmm. dance style music is in the forefront is it just the same as when you go look back to the music that of my parents generation you know you had the frank sinatra's you know you had those big bands and then they fell well wayside to rock and roll and then rock and roll went through their little thing you know you got punk and you know progressive rock and then in the 80s new wave and then the 90s you know and then towards the end of the 90s it started getting more into the dance music i mean it's I guess it's easier to make. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think it is necessarily easier to make. It looks easier to make. I always remember that um, I was I I did um, uh, I've I've done a lot of electronic music here in the studio, and I I had someone uh, say, oh, you know, you just had to press a button, and uh, and and music will come out. And to my and my reply was, well, go on then, you make it. See how hard it is. You know, it's as hard right. as you want to make it. To be really honest with you, right. And I, I personally think that when it comes to rock, you know, being, you know, people think it's being shoved aside, but, you know, by pop bands and hip hop and electronica, it's a, it's an inclusive garden. It's, it's big enough for everything. And I think rock should be underground music. It's always had that vibe to it. It just got commercialized during the eighties and nineties. And we became normalized to having that sort of like sitting on our, our our airways i don't think it ever should have been a popular form of music i think it's always should have been underground whenever i think of of rock music i think of the more esoteric things i'm thinking of the zappers i'm thinking of the the early floyds this was stuff that was away from the mainstream right. and i'm i'm totally happy because you know there will always be fans of, of, oh, yeah. of rock music and i don't think that that's going away it might change but the bottom line here is that you don't have a divine right to be the most popular thing on on the world. You just got to do what you do. Yeah, and um, also too is the rock that you know you have the underground, and then there's some once in a while you see, see some coming up, and there's been a couple of them where I, I call them pretty rock, where it's like. Mm -hmm it's safe you know it's like this is the rock you can take home to your parents you know <laughs> you know you know it's there's no danger here whatsoever <laughs> they may you know okay they probably have a, a couple little tattoos here and there but they're not dangerous you know they're just looking at it and it's just uh i kind of will call it the one one dimensional band yeah yeah i totally get that where it's like you know the real rock is supposed to be aggressive. It's supposed to take chances, you know, yeah. with, you know, program, you know, the guys that you name, you know, Zappers and Floyds out there, you know, those are, they're taking chances. Well, I think it, it comes down to the fact, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to he uh, head on out fairly soon, but to, to, to answer your last question with that is that I genuinely think that if it doesn't make you feel uncomfortable at some level, edgy or excited, it ain't rock. That's exactly. just the way it is. You know, it's supposed to make you feel different. It's supposed to take you out of your, your life. It's supposed to make you feel sometimes uncomfortable, sometimes, uh, you know, if, if it doesn't hit you with that some level of emotion, it ain't rock as far as I'm concerned. Right. Yeah, that's that's how I, I kind of look at it. And as I get older, I'm looking at it more in that sense, you know, because I get, you know, I'm further down the road than I was, you know, and I, I get a lot of that, that maybe some others have gotten it sooner, but, you know, you know, that's, that's, that's the perfect way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, what? thanks very much for letting me. Uh, oh, you're welcome. Uh, and Joe, always and, a pleasure to talk to you, uh, Ron. And you can uh, let everybody know that, We'll, re we'll be returning. This is a, this is part one in a, in a way. So we'll be returning when uh, Tribe of Names has the product out there so people can, uh, how to, you know, that, that meme where it goes, it, here's my cash, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, 
All right, mate. Well, it, it was great to speak to you. Oh, and, you too. Uh, and I wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. If this obviously comes out after Thanksgiving, then uh, um, then I obviously uh, wish you a happy Christmas. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay, and um, I'll talk with you soon then. All right, then. All right, thank you. Good to speak to you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.